Porter. reporter is about to bring you another true story of a crime. While not exactly a mystery, it does have drama and suspense. However, I'll let him tell it himself. This true story took place in England 12 years before Shakespeare was born. Our scene is the home of Woodley Hartgill. We discover this gentleman, Lady Stoughton and her son, Charles Lord Stoughton, in deep discussion. The time, late in April, 1552. Seems strange to me, Mother, that you should persist in staying here. Why can't you live at home where you belong? Frankly, Charles, I don't trust you. You don't trust me, your own son? No, Charles, I don't. So I shall continue staying here with Mr. Hartfield. I don't understand you, Mother. What your mother is trying to tell you, Lord Stoughton, is that she feels her life would not be secure in her own home. Are you insinuating that I would murder my own mother? She is all that stands between you and the estates your father left. Even that isn't sufficient reason for these hints. You realize, of course, that you can lose the estates you now control. Only if you marry again. This, then Westminster would fall into the hands of your second husband. And I know you'd stop at nothing to prevent that. It's about these rumors that I came here today. These rumors of your remarriage. Well? I wish to know if there's any truth in them. And if I were to tell you there is? Then, as your eldest son, I feel that some provision should be made for me. What sort of provision, your lordship? My affairs don't concern you, Hartgill. I'm still agent for the estates, Lord Stoughton, and as manager for your mother, Mr. I Hartgill should... is right. I will make no arrangements without his consent and approval. Now tell me, what is it you want? All I ask is that you sign a bond turning certain monies over to me, should you marry again. Why ask me to do this, Charles? Haven't I given up my home to you? Don't you collect most of the rents from the estate? What more do you ask? I ask for reasonable assurance that these things will continue. I must have them on paper to protect myself. And should I sign such a paper? Will you promise to leave me here and in peace? Will you promise that your retainers will seek their constant pillaging of Mr. Hartgill's lands and tenants? My tenants have never pillaged Mr. Hartgill's lands or tenants. Don't lie, Charles. It's known all over Somerset. I have, however, given my retainers orders to collect rents which are rightfully mine, if that's what you mean. That isn't true, Your Lordship. Your men have been taking money and produce from my tenants. Your tenants? Beggars living on property that's rightfully mine. That still remains for you to prove, Your Lordship. You refuse to admit that you stole this property from my father, don't you, Hartgill? Charles, how can you say that? I say it because it's true. I'll never admit these lands belong to Hartgill, and I'll fight him for them till the day of my death. Then, Charles, I must refuse to sign any barn in your favor. You take this low-born upstart's part against your own son? Right is right, Charles. I could not do otherwise. Your mother is within her legal bounds, and I'm sure the courts will uphold her in her decision. The courts? Refuge of thieves and schemers like you, Hartgill. I'll have what's mine if I have to take it. I promise you resistance from now on, Your Lordship. I shall answer force with force. Is this a declaration of war? It's a declaration that I shall use whatever means are necessary to prevent you from taking what is mine. Lord Stoughton's raids on Hartgill's tenants continued until finally Hartgill took the matter into court and was awarded 730 pounds in damages. 
The day has come for Stoughton to pay, so he and his retainers are drawn up in front of Hartgill's house. Ilmington. Mr. Norton. Norton. Oh, sir. Ferraz. Yes, sir. Remember the signal. When I say the words, true men, you are to lead the attack on Hartgill and his followers. Can you remember that? Yes, your lordship. True men. Correct. Our object is to take Hartgill prisoner and carry him back to Westminster Hall. Yes, your lordship. Wyatt, Hartgill's coming. Yes. Go back to your men. Yes, my lord. Yes, sir. Lord Stoughton. Mr. Hartgill. You have kept your appointment. I have come to pay the damages the court has awarded you. When we agreed to this meeting, your lordship, our agreement was that you should come unarmed and without your followers. Well, my followers are here to see I get fair play. Haven't you always received fair play from me, your lordship? That is a matter of opinion, Hartgill. To me, this whole affair is an injustice. Why must we be continually bickering? We're neighbors, and we should be friends. Right you are, Hartgill. And I'm here to make the first move in that direction. I've come to pay you the 730 pounds which the court has ordered. You may come into my house and give it to me there. That I can't do, Hartgill. I've sworn never to go under your roof again. If you want your money, come and get it. I see many enemies of mine about your lordship, and I'm very much afraid to come any nearer. Norton! Yes, sir! Ferraz! Kilmington! Uh, yes, my lord! Have the men retire ten paces. Yes, sir. Step back with ten paces, men. Back in there, Mr. Lord. Back in there. Now, are you satisfied, Hartgill? Now do you believe in the honesty of my intentions? I shall come closer, your lordship. Good. You and yours are true men, Hartgill. This is signal! Come on, Get Hartgill! You betrayed your trust. You've broken your word. I give no promises to scoundrels. Tie him up, you fool. Take your hands off me, you rebel. Find him. Tie him up. I have friends. You regret this, Stoughton. Lord Stoughton, to you, you upstart. Oh, you'd not strike me if I weren't bound. Off to Westminster Hall with him. I'll teach him to oppose his betters. Heart till you'll get a lesson in manners you'll never forget. Hartgill was taken to Westminster Hall and locked up in a small outhouse. It is now late in the next afternoon. The men have carried out your orders, Lord Stoughton. And Hartgill has been thoroughly thrashed? Yes, your lordship. Within an inch of his life. I shall go out and see for myself. Where is he? He's lying on your lawn, just outside your window. Take me to him. I must see for myself. Yes, your lordship. This way. Tonight we'll take him back to his home and leave him on his own doorstep, bound and beaten. Here he is, your lordship. Well, Hartgill, do you think you've learned your lesson? Are you still strong for opposing your betters? What's wrong with him? He's probably fainted, sir. Well, bring the beggar, too. I want to talk to him. He doesn't seem to respond, sir. Perhaps a good kick will bring him around. What's wrong with him? I don't know, your lordship. Why, the man's dead. Lordship. Now what's to be done? This is murder, Norton, and we're all in it. In it up to our necks. We didn't intend to kill him, your lordship. It's probably better so. What did you do to him? I did as you ordered, sir. Tied him up and had the men thrash him with staves. Well, he's dead. There's nothing we can do to bring him back to life. What can we do now, your lordship? There's only one thing we can do. Bury him. But where, your lordship? Throw him in the pit that was left when we filled in the moat. You're going to bury him in an unsanctified ground? No, you fool. I'm going to make a nice grave for him in the churchyard and put a stone over his head with this inscription. Here lies William Hartgill, murdered by Charles Lord Stoughton and his followers. Oh, but your lordship, they'll hang us. Not if they can't find him. So take hold of his shoulders and I'll take his feet and we'll throw him in the pit. Yes, your lordship. Well, hurry. Do you want the whole county to see us? He's a bit hard to manage, your lordship. You should have thought of that and made him walk to the pit. Oh. What was that? It was him, your lordship. You think he's coming too? I don't know, your lordship. It sounded as though that groan came from the tomb. Stop talking nonsense, Norton. Oh. There it is again, your lordship. Slit his throat and he'll soon stop it. I can't, your lordship. I can't. Give me the knife. You keep it well sharpened, Norton. Yes, your lordship. Turn him on his back. There now. He'll groan no more. Throw him in. 
Get some of your men to cover him with dirt, Norton. Your Lordship, Your Lordship, Your Lordship! What is it? There's a body of men coming up the highway headed by Sir Anthony Hungerford. The Sheriff of Somerset. Yes, yes Your Lordship. Quick, Norton, get that body covered. Yes, Your Lordship. Come help me, for that. Hurry, before they get here, keep your mouths closed, and I'll go to meet them and do all the talking. Yes, Your Lordship. What's that? Then? Sir Anthony? I've come for William Hartgill, who I understand is being held here against his will. I assure you, Sir Anthony, there's been a mistake. No use beating about the bush, Stoughton. I know he's here. You men, search the yes. house and ground. Yes, sir, Anthony, yes, sir. Uh, I have here a complaint, Lord Stoughton, charging you with a felony of abduction. It is sworn to by several persons of good repute, which compels me to take you into custody. I shan't run away, nor do I intend to resist. I repeat, however, there has been an error. We'll first see what the results of the search are, and then perhaps we can discuss it. As you wish. But I assure you, Hartgill isn't here. You've had many quarrels with him, haven't you? Many of them. He's a hard person to get on Sir with. Anthony! Sir Anthony! Sir Anthony! What, what is, is it? it? We, we've just found the body of William Hartgill. The body, did you say? Yes, sir. Two men were about to bury it. The throat has been slit from ear to ear. What have you to say to that, Stoughton? Nothing. Charles... Lord Stoughton, in Her Majesty's name, I arrest you for the willful murder of William Hartgill. Charles Lord Stoughton was placed on trial a short time later. The next scene is in the court. Charles Lord Stoughton, the time has come to plead to the complaints made against you. You are accused of murdering a freeholder. One William Hartgill. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? I refuse to plead, Your Worship. You refuse to plead? Do you realize I cannot go on with this trial until you do? Yes, Your Worship. Perhaps that is why I refuse. The whole matter is a farce at best. Charles Lord Stoughton, rise. I order you to be taken to a mean room stopped from the light and to be laid on your back on the bare floor, your hands and feet stretched and tied to staples, then shall be laid on your body as much iron and stone as you can bear, and more, starting with 350 pounds. You shall be left thus until you either plead to this charge or die. But your worship, you're sentencing me, one of the Queen's lords, to be pressed. When you refuse to plead, I have no other choice. Perhaps you prefer to change your mind before it is too late. Very well. I plead. I plead guilty, acknowledging the felonies of abduction and murder. Then this is all there is left to be said. Charles Lord Stoughton, hear your sentence. You are to be taken hence to a public place where there is a gallows, there to be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. And Charles Lord Stoughton went to his death consoled by the fact he was being hanged with a silken rope. And so the police reporter comes to the end of another true story of a crime. This is a radio release production.